Hi, my name is Carl Hoppe. I'm an Extension Livestock Specialist here at the NDSU Carrington Research Extension Center, a part of an NDSU Extension. And today we're going to talk about feeds and rations for backgrounding calves. First, I'd like to say is feeds follow the corn price in North Dakota. Feed prices um, are based off of whatever the corn price is across the United States, and that comes up to North Dakota. And all of our co-product feeds or hay prices are all based off the energy cost that comes in with corn. Minus, of course, some freight issues, but for the most part, as the corn price goes up, the price of competing feeds also go up as well. Let's uh, talk a little bit about different feeds that we have available and uh, discuss this. And it, two years ago, in October of 2017, the beginning of backgrounding season, corn was around 288 a bushel, alpha value was $80 a ton, and dry distillers drains were at $113 a ton. Jump ahead one year to 2018, last year, corn was $3 a bushel, alfalfa hay $90 a ton, and dried distillers is $130. Now, if we jump one more year to this year, we've had corn prices this year a little bit higher at $340 a bushel. That has come down now over the past few weeks, uh, mostly because that particular time of October, our ethanol plants were searching for corn since corn was still out in our fields, not harvested, and they had to raise the price and encourage some movement into the processing plants for ethanol. Alfalfa hay is at $90 a ton and dry distillers remain at $130 a ton. And you can see the price of the other feeds that we have there. Grass hay at $65 a ton, wheat mids at $105 a ton. Corn silage is around $3, excuse me, $30 per ton. And then uh, canola meal is a competing feed stuff at uh, $206 a ton. And that's uh, basically considered a protein supplement. We have a lot of feed stuffs available in North Dakota. And we just don't appreciate how much we really do have available. And so we still look at a map and see the different processing facilities that we have across the state. We have ethanol, excuse me, we have sugar beet refineries up and down the Red River Valley as well out in uh, western North Dakota over at Sydney, Montana, um, where sugar beet pulp or tailings are available as a feed. We have uh, potato processing occurring in Jamestown as well as uh, Grand Forks. So there's potato products um, that are available. We have a malt plant that is operating over at Moorhead. We have a high fructose corn syrup plant and the corn gluten feed that's available down in Richland County. And we have wheat mills available in North Dakota. And actually, I should maybe have talked about those first. Let me just put into context of how much wheat mids that we produce in our state. Wheat mids are the byproduct of the wheat milling industry have to take off the flour of the semolina. And just to note how large of an industry we have in North Dakota, Grand Forks, where the state mill and elevator is, is the largest milling facility in the world at one location. Um, we export a lot of uh, wheat mids away from North Dakota for feeding. Um, we have a, a wheat mills located in Foster County with Dakota growers up in Minot, as well as down in Richland County. And uh, so, we have wheat middlings available. And of course, we have a, an abundance of ethanol byproduct or dried distillage grains or modified or wet distillage grains, if you want, or a wet product, available throughout the state and uh, surrounding states. We actually do have oil crushes too in the state. And um, those that crush soybean mill would have a soy hull, which is a fiber source that can be utilized for cattle. Uh, and of course, they always produce the meals that are available for uh, livestock feed as well. We have a lot of co-products available to us in North Dakota if we're seeking for supplements or feed replacements, or if we're in a feed shortage area, we have uh, a lot of milling capability available to us uh, for use in cattle feeds. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some daily nutrient feed costs. Here we got a 700 pound steer eating around 3% of body weight or about 18 pounds of dry matter intake. Um, the TDN of this ration is 14 pounds TDN, and if we look, want to consider this on a megacal basis, we can look at 57 megacals of net energy for gain. Crude protein is 13.1% for this ration. The bulk of the ration is really energy. We need 14 pounds of TDN, which is a measurement of energy, and energy cost of used corn would be around 5 cents per pound of TDN. So 14 times 5 gives us around 70 cents per day 
of energy needed to get this calf to grow and gain. Protein's needed too. Calf needs 2.3 pounds of protein. Protein's expensive. It's double, triple the price at 18 cents. So if we just had to consider the protein cost, it'd be 42 cents per calf per day. However, most time when we buy corn, which is 90% crude protein, we don't need to pay twice for the protein. In other words, we get the energy and the protein comes for free. But we do have to pay for a supplemental protein because a 9% crude protein, that's a ways away from the 13% crude protein the calf needs. So in this example, the calf needs 2.33 pounds of protein. The TDN side of the feed that supplies some protein is 1.74 pounds. Excuse me, there's 1.74 pounds of TDN in that 14 uh, 1.7 pounds of crude protein and the 14 pounds of TDN that's used to feed the calf. And so supplementally, we need 0.59 pounds or 0.6 pounds of crude protein added to this ration, or for a cost around 10 cents per head per day, 10 to 11 cents per head per day. So my point is, when we're feeding cattle, the energy cost is by far the most expensive input for feeding cattle. Protein is what we usually end up having to buy extra. We think that's expensive, but really on a per day basis, the energy cost is the most expensive thing. And water really isn't very expensive at all, but we do need good quality water for our cattle in order to have them gain. Let's look at feed value or cost per pound of nutrient. Canola meal, that's a protein source. It's 38% crude protein. Cost per ton is $219. If you do that on a cost per pound of crude protein, you're at 28 cents. It's a protein source. So if we look at cost per pound of TDN, it's 17 cents, and it's an expensive source of energy, but a pretty competitively priced source of, of protein. Now let's look at corn grain. That's third line down. It's only got 8.5% crude protein, and 70, but it's got 76.5% TDN. Cost is $110 a ton. So if you look at cost per pound of, of energy, it's at 70 at seven cents. But if we look at the cost per pound of crude protein at 64, corn obviously is not a protein source, it is an energy source. But now sometimes we can have our cake and eat it too. In other words, look at the wheat mids. That's 17% 70, protein, $95 cost per ton. So we look at cost per pound of crude protein, it's 27 cents. Look at cost per pound of energy, it's six cents. Actually, it's cheaper as a cost of energy than the other feedstuffs, and its protein cost is fairly reasonable as well. Let's look at down distillage grains. That's a popular feed to be added into cattle diets. It's almost 30% protein on an as-fed basis. Cost right now is $130 at, at the plant. Cost per pound of crude protein, that would be $2, excuse me, 24 cents. Pretty reasonable, cheapest cost of protein in this example. And then we look at cost per pound of TDN, and it's seven cents. So it's not out of line. Um, but we can look at the different feedstuffs here and, and come up with an idea of what we want to feed along with transportation costs that have to include, be included when we're looking at different feedstuffs. Let's just talk a little bit about some feed issues for 2019 to 2020. This last fall was a real bugger when it came to corn silage. It was a tough year to harvest. And see, we had to pull through muddy fields, and and uh, it delayed harvest, so we didn't get the moisture content up as high as we wanted it to have. Um, it's just been a real challenge. Although, I'll have to say, the quality of the feed that we were getting off the field was actually fairly high. If it fermented, it would it would produce a good fermented silage. If it was, if it didn't get the chance to ferment, it was a little bit drier. Um, I'm surprised how well the energy content in that feed is actually fairly decent. So, uh, some more feed issues for 2019 is that we have a delayed corn harvest. Uh, and a lot of that corn is still standing out in the field right now. So, if we would like to have some wet corn for our cattle, I'd like to buy some, but unfortunately. It's still standing out in the field. We're waiting for it to dry down out in the field so it has to be uh, uh, propane dried or, or natural gas dried or some other way of drying it down. And the test weight will usually increase if it's left out in the field as well. So with those issues, we're not seeing a lot of corn being moved right now. But for an ethanol plant, they need corn, but they don't need light test weight corn. And they don't want to deal with high moisture corn because they have to dry it down 
to 15% moisture before they can grind it and add it and put it through the ethanol plant. They have discounts and there's a reason for that. Light test weight corn usually has less starch, which means it takes more bushels of corn to make the same amount of ethanol. However, for cattle, that's not the issue. Cattle can utilize that light test weight corn because there's a germ in the fiber and they can use it quite well. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Storing high moisture corn. Well, if you can feed it right away, that certainly works. If you can lay it on the ground and, and maybe grind it and put it up as high moisture uh, corn that in siles, that's one way to keep it. However, in this frozen weather we have like this, that doesn't really work very well. Earlage is another example. You could snap off the ears and, and feed that as such. You get 20% more feed when you feed the cob uh, from that field. And again, with earlage, you hope that it would ferment. High moisture corn, the same way, you hope it ferment. However, if it's too cold to ferment, then perhaps we just look at keeping it frozen until it's fed. However, be careful. Piles will tend to heat on their own, even if they're frozen, if there's by some heat source that could get them going. A heat source could be sunlight, it could be solar, the warmth of the day, or it could be ground that uh, wasn't frozen completely hard and the Corn's been laying on top of it for a couple, two, three, four weeks, and all of a sudden there's some heat being generated from the earth up into the pile. The microbes get going, and now we have mold on our feed. So if you're going to look at freezing as a way to contain your corn or maintain these feedstuffs at high moisture, be sure to make sure it stays frozen as we work through the, the feeding period. Light test weight corn. NDSU did a trial a few years back where we compared 54 pound corn to 47 pound corn to pretty light 39 pound corn, and they found cattle gained fairly similarly. It just meant that on the light test weight corn, some of those calves did gain, did eat a little bit more um, just because it was 39 pound corn, but the 54 and 57, there really wasn't any difference in gain ability for the cattle. University of Bass agreed with that. They did 56 pound and 47 pound corn. They found no difference when it came to feeding cattle. South Dakota State actually found that light test weight corn actually fed better to a small group of calves. And so it just tells me, I like to summarize this up by light test weight corn isn't a problem for feeding our ruminant livestock. Be sure to feed it by the pound, not by the volume. So use the scale and buy things by the ton um, for uh, feeding light test weight corn. We do have some frozen corn silage out there this year, as I affectionately call it frozen brown chop because corn silage would imply that it has fermented and the frozen brown chop certainly hasn't. So if you look at this thermometer, this pile was chopped on a cold day below 32 degrees, 24 degrees, and it was packed on the same day where it was frozen and it went into the pile frozen. And you can see by the temperature gauge, a month later, it's still frozen. It takes a long time for these piles to heat and this pile may never heat. Part of the pile from the top is heated because of the warm weather we had at a certain time, but it has not migrated down into the pile and perhaps it never will. But if we look at, so it's not a fermented feed, but it is a stored feed. And if we look at the nutrient value of these feeds, they're actually fairly high. So um, we haven't lost any energy by feeding it. We've just lost that nice fermented smell. Uh, cattle still eat this. Some other issues, wheat, We've had some milling quality problems, fallen numbers, vomitoxin on it. Um, it can certainly be fed to cattle. We just need to look at the quality and the cost. And uh, vomitoxin is limited by the FDA at 10 parts per million. Uh, we've done projects at Carrington that would show that that has no problems in feeding cattle that that level. Um, flooded haze uh, can be an issue. For every foot in the water, it's probably mold a foot above the water. So be sure to check out those bales just to see how molded they are if you do bring them home for feeding. On a young calf, that digestive system just doesn't withhandle mold very well, especially on haze, and that could decrease intake, decrease performance, and what you're hoping to get in weight gain may not happen if there's extensive molding going on. I got a series of rations here for you. 700 pound steers. And my point is, as we increase the gain, we usually get better feed efficiency. And when we get better feed efficiency, we usually have a lower cost per pound of gain. So here's our first example. Grass hay, 13 pounds, wheat mid, 7 pounds. We're going to have a 2 pound a day ration gain here on these calves. Feed conversion is 10 to 1. And uh, the cost per pound of gain is 38 cents. Let's tweak this ration a little bit. 
Put in a little more wheat mids, take out some grass hay, put in some alfalfa hay. We're going to get a 2.6 pound a day gain, take a little bit of less feed to put on the same amount of gain, and we see that it went from a 38 mega cal up to a 45 mega cal ration, but our feed cost per gain went down from 38 down to 32. Now, if we tweak this ration a little bit more and just use a lot more wheat mids and some grass hay, and we have to add some calcium to this since wheat mids are high in, high in phosphorus but low in calcium, so we need to balance this ration by adding some extra calcium to it. We get a 2.8 pound a day gain. As you can see, our feed cost went down to 30 cents. So this trend continues. Let's look at a ration that's alfalfa hay and corn silage. 1.8 is a nice average daily gain if you're growing heifers heading to pasture to be bred, or if we're looking for grass calves that are going to be head to pasture um, at a lighter weight. Our feed costs, though, look at that, is 46 cents per pound of gain. That's not our cheapest feed cost, but we're feeding to a different marketing window, so please consider what you're doing here. Our cost to gain for our of a 2.6 pound gain ration here, we're using grass hay, alfalfa hay, corn grain, and wheat mids, is uh, 33 cents. And if we tweak those to get a little bit better average daily gain of 3 pounds, we'll be at uh, 31 cent per cost of gain. Here's some rations just using alfalfa hay and corn grain, a 2.3 pound a day gain, 42 cent feed cost. If we look at buying a commercial protein supplement, 38% that fed at a pound and a half per head per day with corn and alfalfa hay, <clears throat> three pounds a day gain. We can get good gains out of these calves, 41 cent per pound a gain, or if we get them to be a 3.4 pound a day gain, we can be up to 38 cents per pound a gain, or down to 38 cents per pound a gain. These higher rates, again, are probably appropriate for calves that are heading to be finished, maybe finished on farm and sold as uh, fat cattle. And these cattle, this type of ration will certainly work quite well for those cattle. Actually, you could pick up that average gain even more if you go from a 55 up to a, 50, up to a 62 NEG ration. But we're talking about backgrounding calves here, not finishing cattle, so we'll leave it at this rate. Got one more ration, one more set of rations here, and these deal with distillers grains. Grass hay at 15% or 15 pounds per day and distillers grains at 5 pounds. Um, give it 1.8, 1.7, average daily gain with a 47 cent cost to gain. I think I've seen that number earlier behind when you looked earlier in this slide set when we talked about 1.8 pounds a day gain, uh, a little under 50 cents per pound. Okay, but as we pick up our rate of gain, we get into 30 cents. And if we look so if we get a 2.6 average daily gain or a 3 pound average daily gain, as you pick up the rate of gain, the cost per pound of gain goes down. So let me talk a little bit about some gain goals. If we're looking at heading for next spring's grass market, having calves at a low rate of gain, less than 2 pounds a day gain, is what our goal should be. However, as I said earlier, our lowest cost of gains are with better rates of gain. So let's look at a medium rate of gain at two to three pounds per day. Cattle growing at that level won't add much condition. They'll gain way, way they'll gain very well. Um, buyers will be lined up to buy them uh, and feed yards will find good performance out of these calves because they weren't overly fed. However, um, our other, when we look at higher rates of gain, like above three pounds a day gain, you know, you really ought to be looking at going to the finishing, to the feedlot or the finishing market with these calves because if you're going to stop them at eight, 900 pounds and try to sell them, um, buyers may not want to have those because they don't really have much compensatory gain in them. They might be too fat. They might stall out in the feed yard before they're placed on feed. But let me point this out. There are some cattle that are genetic proposed, exposed to great weights of gain without loss of performance, and they can still gray and grow grow and grade extremely well. So my point here is know what type of cattle you have and how you want to how you want to uh, feed them to the performance you'd like to have. If you know the history, that'll go a long ways knowing what you do. If you don't know the history, you're either going to do less than two pounds a day if you're heading for grass cattle. If not, after that, then you're going to go somewhere between two to three pounds a day gain uh, as a good backgrounding. So get these calves grown and healthy and moved on before calving starts again like to say that we're always looking for, I look for, targeting calf gain with a balanced ration. I said earlier, as we increase our energy and protein, we get better gains and better feed efficiency. So our cost of gain is lower as we pick up our rates of gain. 
However, backgrounding is one of these deals where you have a flexibility in when we want to sell calves. If you're selling fat cattle, when they're fat, you've maximized the value out of those calves. Uh, feeding them any longer gets them fatter, and that actually decreases the value, yield grade fours, those types of things. And you have a product that has a shorter time that needs to be sold. However, backgrounding, you have a lot of flexibility, whether it be this month, next month, six months from now. It all depends upon the rate of gain you're looking to have those calves on. And honestly, when you're looking at lower rates of gain, you're really hoping for a different market and a different price. And when you combine those two together with low cost of haze, you might end up uh, better off than hedging on what I like to say, better gains with better feed efficiency and growth. So good luck in your decision of how you want to maintain calves. And uh, if you have any questions on rations or balancings, please contact me, Carl Hoppy, Extension Livestock Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center, part of NDSU Extension.